share with you just briefly the focus of our teaching in the coming weeks. Uh, we are going to take a short hiatus uh, from 1 John today, and next Sunday we are going to focus some attention, as I mentioned already, on the area of missions, our responsibility uh, to take the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the world, so world missions. And then after that, when we enter the month of March, we are going to be working our way through the final chapters of John's gospel in preparation for Easter Sunday. So each week, uh, we are going to consider one of the moments that led up to Jesus' death and his resurrection as John conveys that in his gospel. And so if you have friends who are uh, trying to better understand Jesus and Christianity, these will be great weeks for them to come and for them to hear who Jesus is, what, what was happening in these final hours, the significance of those things. If you have non-church friends who are just needing encouraged, uh, this will be a great opportunity to bring them out uh, so that they can understand uh, again and fully what it means that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for us. But today I want to begin in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. I'm going to ask you to turn there with me, Acts 1 and verse 6. We don't have one particular passage today. We've got a variety that we're going to look at together. But I want to begin here. So when they had come together, they asked him, they asked Jesus, these are the disciples. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This is after his death, his resurrection. Would be a great time uh, to be crowned king of Israel after you rose from the dead. But he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth or the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking at the heavens? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So here we find that Jesus instructs his disciples to be witnesses of him. Witnesses of what he has accomplished in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the world. And they are to do this by the Holy Spirit's power. This is not something they're to take up on their own power and by their own wisdom. And so what happens is they go back to Jerusalem and they wait for the coming of that Holy Spirit. This instruction is similar to what we find in Matthew chapter 28 and 18 and 20, what is called the Great Commission. Jesus says to them, All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything that I have commanded and instructed of you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And according to the book of Acts, that's exactly what they did. It's exactly what we see the disciples doing. They're taking the Gospels to other people. It does start in Jerusalem, and then it spreads to Judea and on into Samaria, and, and much of that is, is forced upon them through the persecution of the church and the fact that they are spread out now. They can't remain in Jerusalem any longer. And so they're going to other communities and places taking the Gospel of Jesus. Fast forward with me. Turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. We're going to see what's happening at the church at Antioch, which is north. It's in what would be modern-day Turkey today. The gospel is spread thus far into this particular region, and it says in Acts 13, verse 1, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Serene, Menain, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and they sent them off. 
So what's happening here in Acts chapter 13? Well, it's fascinating to see the names that are listed here in Acts chapter 13. Uh, these are the leaders of the church at Antioch, and this is a very diverse and multicultural church when we think about the, the different groups of people that make it up, but we don't have time to think about that and to talk through that today. But the church at Antioch is sending people. What, what we see happening here now is the Holy Spirit says, I want you to take Barnabas and Saul and separate them and send them to some other places so that they can take the gospel of Jesus. In the end, what are they trying to do? They're trying to establish and start churches much like the church that they are a part of in Antioch in new communities in other places. The remainder of the book of Acts continues to tell the story of how the gospel would spread throughout the world, much of it following particularly the Apostle Paul and his work, his missionary journeys. If you get bored during the sermon, look at the back of your Bible at the map of Paul's missionary journeys and just see where he took the gospel into these variety of places. But beyond Scripture, church history tells us the story of how the gospel would continue to spread through the centuries into new countries, into new places, to the very present today where we sit because the gospel was spread and communicated by somebody at some point. And so it is in the pages of Scripture that we find the roots of this idea of world missions, the gospel going forth. What is our role then in this gospel advancement? What is our role in world missions? Well, as I see it in Acts 13, there are two primary roles when it comes to missions. There are goers and there are senders. There are goers like Paul and Barnabas and later Silas and Timothy and Titus and Luke and many others. And then there are senders. Sorry about that. That's probably going to keep happening. There are senders like the people who made up the church of Antioch who sent them along. And then it, it, as you would study through the book of Acts, you would note that as certain churches were started in certain locations, those churches would further send the Apostle Paul and others to new places and to new regions. Goers and senders. A goer is a person who is specially gifted and I believe specifically commissioned by the church to not only take the gospel to another group of people, but to establish biblical churches that will continue to replicate that process. A goer in the context of missions isn't just somebody who shares the gospel with another person. If that were the criteria, we are all goers because we are all told to share the gospel with the people who God places around our lives, in our Jerusalems, in the world we live in. But goers or missionaries are proclaiming the gospel. They are doing that, but they are also working either with established churches or ministries. They're either training up leaders. They have a special, particular role in building up and advancing the gospel in other locations around the world. Let's talk about our own missions partners. Next week, Craig and Jennifer Alsip will be with us, and they will get to share what the Lord is doing with them, but they primarily work with manna worldwide. And Craig oversees Central Asia, and so there's many different manna centers in those particular locations. Nepal is one that he goes to with frequency. Uh, Fiji is the one that we support, and he goes there yearly. But he's there helping the churches make connections to these centers and, and then uh, taking groups there so that they can engage and see what's happening on the front lines. This is what man of worldwide does some of us several years ago were able to take that trip to guatemala where we were able to be a part of those man of feeding centers and and see on the front lines what's happening as people are not only being fed food and uh, given treatment for medical things or or being cared for in an orphanage but they're being shared the gospel of jesus and they're being given hope in the process brian barry one of our newest missionaries is going to ireland he looks like he's from Ireland with his red hair. Uh, but he is going to Ireland to share the gospel in a place that is quite cold to Christ. 
Britain has churches closing at a rapid rate every year. And Brian's going to work with those churches and to try to revitalize. And eventually I know he has in his desire to plant churches there in Ireland as he shares the hope of Jesus with people. We want to pray for Brian. Brian's dating somebody. He's a single guy. Uh, but he's dating somebody right now, and so we want to pray for that. I know if you remember him being here, that was one of his prayers. I want a wife. And uh, so we've been praying for that, and uh, we're excited for him as well. Curtis and Jennifer Campbell are missionaries that we support through Wycliffe Bible Translators. Uh, one of the things that is lacking in many places still around the world is a Bible that people can read in their own language. And that, that would be sad, wouldn't it? We take it for granted that we can have, what, 75 different translations in the English language. Some places have no translations into their language. Craig and Jen, or Curtis and Jennifer are on a small island of Indonesia called Cebu, and they are working with a group of people uh, to translate the scriptures into their language so that they can know and understand and continue to read. I love that we get to support Bible translation work. It's an amazing gift. Eli and Rebecca, da or let me go with Phil and Jessica Coolball first. Uh, Phil and Jessica are in Toronto, and they moved there with the sole purpose of sharing the gospel with um, Muslims. God had given them a burden when they were living in St. Louis. They had kind of been in a community of those who were in Islam and that religion, and they had a burden. And so... One of the greatest populations that's open is Toronto. Lots of refugees, lots of people who are moving to that area. And Phil and Jessica are there this year. Right now, they're putting together a team, and they're going to be planning a church in 2024 in Toronto. And, and if there's one thing that's lacking in Toronto, it is churches. Good churches. And we want to pray for them. We want to support them in whatever way we can in that endeavor. It is one of the, the largest groups of cities around it's amazing how many millions of people are there and how few gospel lights there are in that community eli and rebecca dow are not traditional missions partners with us but we pray for them with regularity we don't have to support them with our offerings we support them with our taxes uh, because eli is a chaplain for the united states air force currently serving at cannon air base in new mexico on the front lines working with those airmen and women in sharing the gospel and uh, trying to help them through their crisis in life, trying to help them to better understand Jesus and uh, dear friends of our church as well, David and Crystal Houghton. Um, David and Crystal are special. They work with the deaf in Mexico. One of their primary objectives is to, to reach those who are uh, even harder to reach through ministry to the deaf and so they've worked there for close to 20 years now and working with churches and camps and uh, you can if you follow them on youtube you'll see david preaching every week it's it's recorded it's it's put out there and they are ministering the gospel to the deaf there in mexico tim and jackie long uh, tim and jackie worked with refugees in the middle east uh, for years they spent their time in egypt helping to establish and plant churches. And when that became um, an impossibility, they had to move recently to the island of Cyprus, uh, one of the very first places that Paul and Barnabas landed when they left in Acts chapter 13 was on the island of Cyprus. And they live there and they're working there and ministering to multiple nations in that region and those who are suffering as a result of um, war, poverty, natural disasters. When those earthquakes hit Turkey uh, within this last year and, and killed thousands upon thousands of people and displaced them, many of them had, came to Cyprus. Tim and Jackie were there to minister the gospel and be of hope to them. Marcus and Kayla Mackey uh, are church planters in Indian Hills, Colorado. Uh, I think they may be our newest uh, partnership, and uh, they have gone to Indian Hills where there was no church. Somewhere in the mountains outside of Denver, terribly ugly place to be I imagine I see the pictures but they're there every week ministering the gospel and God is blessing that church if you follow their letter if you follow them online 
They are growing. We're going to watch a video next week of a testimony of one of the families that's a part of that ministry now. And I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. We, we want to have, we want to support church planners in, in, in the United States who are going to places where churches are not. And, and this is a great partnership for us. Patrick and Anjanelle McClure are serving in one of the largest cities in the world, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And they have served there faithfully. Patrick grew up in Brazil. And they have served in multiple churches in multiple situations. Patrick does a lot to train up leadership and disciple pastors and leaders uh, to lead in these churches. And Anjanelle right there helping with women's ministry and helping pastors' wives. An incredible couple doing incredible work. J.A. and Pam Richards are, are retired missionaries. And we're continuing to honor them, continuing to support them. They served for decades in Wales, um, probably a harder place to serve than even Ireland. Uh, and they served and started a church and continued to work with that church. And from that church, started other churches in that time frame. Jay and Pam, faithful servants who had to move back to the United States because of health issues. Just got a card this last week, actually, from them. Uh, J.A. just wanted to thank this congregation for the extra money uh, that we were able to send around Christmas. Uh, we were able to send it to all of our missions partners. Uh, but he had had a back surgery recently that he is not healing from uh, very well. And that extra money has gone a long way uh, to help and be a blessing to him and his wife. And then Eric and Amanda Shadle uh, are missions partners in Ethiopia. And Eric and Amanda moved there again probably 15 years ago, and they started Bethel Baptist Church just outside of the capital city of Addis in a town called Ayat. And that church is faithfully continuing to spread the gospel. And um, we have given to that. We've given to that church special offerings over the years so that they could buy land. They're now in the process of trying to, to raise the funds to build their own building, which is a huge thing in that particular region. Uh, if they wouldn't have to pay the exorbitant rent amounts. And uh, so trying to establish this church uh, so that it can establish other churches. And Eric is working, raising up leadership in that church, and it's been amazing to watch that over the years. And in order for these missionaries, our missions partners, to do what they do, they need support. They need someone to send them. They need senders. And that is where most of us come in. Uh, some of you in this room might someday be a goer. And I would love that. I would love for the Spirit to raise up one of our kids to go, to take the gospel, to plant churches to the nations. Truly, if we're going to be um, honest and, and as forthright as we could be about this, uh, the Cool Balls, who I just mentioned, the Dows, the Hotons, the Richards, and the Shadles all sat where you sat. They all ministered in the same ministries that you serve in here at Meadowview. They were all members here for a number of years, being trained in the ministry and then sent out into the ministry. Great relationships. What a gift it is for them to know this church and this fellowship and to be out of this fellowship. But if you are not a goer, what are you? What is your responsibility? It's to send. The, the Great Commission isn't just for goers. It's for senders. So how do we send? What does it require of us? i got three things for you. Money. You knew that was coming, right? It, it requires money. What we call support. Currently, we support all of these partners at $200 per month. Um, obviously, that is not enough money for them to live on if you're thinking... Wow, they, they live on $200 a month. There are other churches like ours that support them at various amounts, and this collective of churches enables them to go to the field. Some of our missionaries have, have 50 supporting churches, some of them closer to 100 supporting churches that enable them to live on the field, to pay for their rent, to pay for their food, to support the ministry that they're trying to get started, that, that's church expenses and a variety of other things, 
It takes a lot of people. And the collective idea of that is very cool, but it also comes with significant challenges for our missions partners. There's a lot of churches that, uh, that require certain things of our missions partners that maybe we're a little, uh, we're a little more flexible on. So oftentimes when our, our missions partners come back to the states, they're required to go to those supporting churches and give a report. You understand, if they have 70 supporting churches, there's no way they can make it to all of those. We try to be as gracious as we can be with our missions partners. We, we love for them to come. We love for them to be a part of our worship service. We love for them to share. But we also have realistic expectations that they're tired when they come back from serving on the front lines of missions. When they come back, they, they should be able to rest and not have to work. But what happens a lot of the times is while they're over there serving for four years or six years, when they come back for six months, they have to go to new churches because some of the churches have closed their doors on the United States side. Some of their churches have dropped their support. And now they have to raise additional money. Matter of fact, if you've read Tim and Jackie Long's newest letter, they're on the island of Cyprus. Inflation continues to rise. We all understand that's what's happening around the world. They're having to downsize apartments. So they're having to get something smaller. Uh, they've lost supporting churches on the state side. And so they have less money coming in, greater expenses there. What are they going to do? How do they bridge the gap? That's why we want to be faithful senders. Uh, thankfully, with the management of our missions funds, we have uh, excess money for times like these for our missionaries, and uh, we're sending this month an extra $500 to Tim and Jackie Long to help with some of those expenses that they're going to have and having to furnish this new place and, and make these particular transitions that they're making. That's because of your generosity. That's because of your faithfulness to give to missions that we're able to step in to these gaps that form sometimes for our missions partners. But I would love to raise our missionary support. Our elders are in complete agreement with this, that we would love to support them. As, as we see stateside, oftentimes many of us get cost of living increases. We would love to, to bump our missionary support up each month. We'd love to get them to $250, to $300, where... It's less of a heartache and headache for them as they deal with the churches stateside. So we ask you to contribute and to contribute regularly for the sake of world missions. And we ask you to, to give and to give sacrificially for the sake of world missions so that we can do more, so that we can raise our missions partner support so that we can maybe in time even add in additional missions partners. I get a letter, an email, or a phone call every week from somebody wanting to get somewhere, and they need support to get there. I'm not saying we would support all of those. Uh, we, we would certainly maybe not agree with all of those, but, but we would certainly want to support some of them. And we want to be better and be better suited to help our missions partners in moments of crisis so that we can step in and be a blessing to them and their families. We need money. Our other responsibility and what it requires of us is to build relationships with our missions partners. This is where we have more work to do. I think we would all agree it's, 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 easy, it's easier to write a check, isn't it? Sometimes we just say, I'm just going to give some money. Ease the conscience. But getting to know our missions partners takes more time. And it takes more effort. Um, here's the way I view it. Our missions partners are extensions of this fellowship. That's the commitment level we've made with them. We're not just throwing money at them. We consider them, in a sense, a member of this church that we have commissioned specifically to go to these places. That means we have these same responsibilities at least to some degree to them that we have to one another 
We want to be there to encourage them as we're called to encourage each other. We want to pray for them as we're called to pray for each other. Uh, to use our gifts to support them and help them in any way we can as we're encouraged to do for one another. That takes an extra bit of effort because they're not sitting across the aisle from you every Sunday. They're not gathering with us, but maybe every decade or so that we actually get to see them. But we want to do what we can to build relationships with them. So what does that look like? Communicate with them. We live in a world now that's quite different than when Adonai Judson and William Carey went out where you couldn't get word to them. Everybody's got an email address now. Many people are online and you can message through Messenger and I can, I can and, and have recently messaged Eric Shadle all the way in Ethiopia and he responded within five seconds. And it was absolutely free thanks to Facebook. We have the ability to keep up with them. And it's not that we want to bother them and ask them a bunch of questions. We want to send messages of encouragement. Just say, hey, I just want you to know our family prayed for you today. Is there any specific things that you'd like to mention that we can pray for? Follow their letters. We, we, we have that beautiful wall downstairs that has all of their letters. And you know what? You can actually email them and get that letter sent directly to you. They will send that to your inbox, and so you don't even have to look at the wall if you don't want to. You can read those as they come in. Most of them send letters quarterly. Some of them send them monthly, uh, just giving us updates. Uh, those of you who are on social media and online, many of our missions partners are on some aspect of social media, and you can kind of keep up with what's going on in their world through that. And then finally, we have to pray. And this is honestly the most important thing. Giving is important. Building relationships is important. But we need to pray that the Spirit would use them. How many times do we see in the New Testament Paul saying, hey, pray for me that the gospel will advance. Pray for this situation so that people will, will listen and come to know. Paul is pleading with the churches, pray, pray, pray. We want to pray for our missions partners. Eric's already preached in Ethiopia. It's already happened. They're in their afternoon, evening now. David Houghton will be starting soon if he hasn't started already. I try to keep track sometimes in my brain. What time on a Sunday are these guys preaching? What time on a Sunday are they teaching those lessons and discipling those leaders and building into the national people there? We want to pray that God would use them. That's why every week we're moving through a constant rotation, praying for one of our missions partners, keeping that in front of you. But what is all of this going and sending for? Certainly we want to be, we want to see people in darkness walking in light. We want to see the lost found. We want to see the hopeless filled with hope. I think one of the most gut-wrenching memories I have is 2002 when me and Faith were in China. And to walk into this compound Buddhist lamasery. And it was just dark. And there are people shuffling around in these dark rooms praying to giant statues. Empty. Void. For many of our missions partners, that's what they see every day. For many of us, that's what we see every day in the faces of our coworkers. Their lives are devoid of light and purpose and hope. We want to see the lost found. We want to see them filled with hope. But, but there is a far more glorious goal that we discover in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Revelation 5, if you would. Here we find the glorious goal of missions. Revelation 5 and verse 6. It says this, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing and though, as though it had been slain. It had seven horns and seven eyes. 
which are the seven spirits of God sent out of all the earth. And he went and he looked to the scroll from the right, he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders, they fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And verse 9 says, They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe. You ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to God, to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. People from every tribe and language singing, worthy are you. Jesus. Look with me at chapter 7 and verse 9. John sees this again. Chapter 7, verse 9. And this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and they're crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their face before the throne. And they worship God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory, and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Our going, met of you, our going, our sending, every trip, every Every dollar that supports a discipleship lesson, every mouth that's fed, that's accompanied with the glorious gospel of Jesus is a contribution to this scene in heaven. The nations along with us. For the people that the McClure's are ministering to this very day will be standing next to them. Worthy is the Lamb. For the people on that island of Cebu who have never opened up God's word and read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And they read that for the first time and their, their life of darkness is infused with light, glorious light, and they're, they're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus will be standing next to us. Worthy are you, Jesus. That's the glorious goal of missions. As we close today, I want you to turn with me to one other place, Psalm 67. We're going to get interactive, do things a little different this morning. I'm going to read Psalm 67 for us out loud. And when I'm done... I want to invite you to, to pair up with some people around you. I don't care how many people that is. Uh, grab people that, that you, you don't know. That's fine. Uh, people outside of your family. And, and your family can, can work through this together. But I want you to read through Psalm 67 together again. And I want you in that group to pray through Psalm 67. And so you can say, well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pray the first verse. I'll pray the second verse, and you'll see how this makes perfect sense. We're praying for the very things that the psalmist is praying for. We want to pray for that for ourselves. We want to pray for that for our missions partners. We want to pray for that uh, for the missions partners we've yet to make, and for the people, the people around the globe who are in need of a Savior. And so, Psalm 67, May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make His face to shine upon us, 
that your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the people with equity and you guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends 